Uh, perhaps by now we will have all uh, taken in the news from yesterday and perhaps we are here at church this, this morning feeling a sense of bewilderment, perhaps a sense of shock, of disbelief uh, of the events at Bondi Junction yesterday, uh, a truly tragic set of circumstances and it's right for us I think as we gather as God's people to, to acknowledge that, perhaps to acknowledge how we are feeling about that, uh, but also an opportunity for us now to pray, uh, to pray for those who have been caught up in this horrendous set of events and uh, to pray for comfort uh, for those who are injured, for their families, for emergency service workers uh, and for ourselves. And so I want to propose before we begin our service formally today that we to spend a moment to be quiet, to acknowledge, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Let's do that. Our sovereign Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the knowledge that as the psalm says you are close to the brokenhearted we grieve this morning the loss of life through these acts of violence in our city please will you comfort all those who grieve or have been impacted by these events we thank you for the police uh, for ambulance and emergency personnel who were first responders to these events and we pray for the recovery of those who have been injured and those who continue to be distressed by these traumatic circumstances. Father, we are confused and distressed by violent and senseless acts in our city. And so we cast our anxieties on you, knowing that you care for us. Please turn our hearts to your son, Jesus, that we may find our rest in him and will you hasten the day when peace and justice reign? And we pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Now, that prayer that I prayed was written by our Archbishop, Kanishka, and uh, the invitation is for all the churches of the diocese uh, to pray in that fashion today. God bless. I'm going to invite Rob to come and start our service. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church, both in person and online. Uh, great to have you with us. My name's Rob. Um, just to let the visitors with us know, um, if you're looking for toilets, out that door and around to the left, and if you keep going down there, there's the parents' room for uh, the little ones, of which we don't seem to have many today. Maybe they're coming. Um, and uh, the other good news is um, the kids, uh, all the kids' activities are on today. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're out. No, they're not out there already. But anyway, I'm sure they'll join us. Um, but friends, let's uh, begin our time of worship and fellowship together by saying uh, a prayer of thanksgiving and then we'll sing two songs. Uh, please would you pray with me. Almighty God, creator and redeemer, we praise you for your work of creation, for the beauty of the world around us and for every gift we enjoy. We bless you for creating us to know you, love you, and obey you. Most of all, we thank you for your amazing love in sending your Son to restore your world, to die for us, and to give us life in all its fullness. Accept, O oh God, our praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, please stand and we'll sing uh, two songs together. First of all, King of Kings.
great joy to be joined by a whole host of more college students and we are going to meet one of them now nat brilliant nat's going to share his testimony but i've just got one question beforehand which is um it's been so good to have you how's your week been just give us uh, maybe a highlight or so yeah great yeah, thanks Hi, Ryan. Great to see you. Um, yeah, it's been a great week. My week's been a little bit funny. I've had sick kids at home and been back and forth a little bit. Um, I was going to say my highlight was the hospital trip to the rehab ward, but la yesterday, actually, I ended up um, handing out flyers at Westfield and got into a two-hour conversation uh, with a man about the Bible. And we talked. We went all over the Old Testament and all over the New Testament to talk about who Jesus was. Um, in the end, he, wasn't, he didn't want me to pray for him. He was quite um, adamant that he didn't believe in Jesus, but I'm so thankful for two hours to speak with him. And even though he didn't want me to pray for him, I have been praying for him. And I do pray that God might work in his heart. Yeah. Great. Well, um, we would love to hear a bit about how you came to put your trust in Jesus. Great. Thanks, Nat. Well, God has been very kind to me. Uh, and his kindness to me actually started with his kindness to my parents. Uh, he saved my father from a, a very strict Catholic background. Uh, a background with kind of no trust in Jesus, but all focused on works. And he saved my mother from uh, a life living for the Aussie dream. And because of that, I don't remember a day where I didn't know about God and didn't know about Jesus. That's such a wonderful privilege. Uh, but just because I have a Christian family doesn't mean I was born a Christian. Uh, and in fact, it took me quite a, a while to realize that I desperately needed Jesus myself. As a kid, I thought God loved me and was proud of me because I was a good kid. That's maybe the story for some of us as well. Uh, I went to church every week and I made sure I took notes. I uh, always was uh, the one who would put my hand up first at Kids Club to answer the questions. When I came home for afternoon tea, I'd look for the most burnt cookie so that other people could have the best ones. I was such a good kid. And so surely, surely God would put his thumbs up to me, right? I thought God must be really proud to have me as part of his team. Well, as is pretty normal for teenagers, I quickly realised I wasn't all that great. Uh, there were desires that I had that were wrong, and I knew they were wrong, but I couldn't escape them. I, I'd fight these desires, but I'd still sin. And so, uh, how could God love me? How could God love me now if, if my, my good childness was actually just a fake? And so... I think the disconnect for me, I, I knew Jesus died for my sins and I knew that uh, in theory that meant I was forgiven, but I, th I didn't understand that I'm not just saved by grace, but I'm kept in God's family by his grace. I think that's what the disconnect was. I thought I was saved by God's generosity, but then I had to do good works to kind of stay in, to stay in his favour. I wonder, maybe your story's a bit like that. It's a horrible place to be. For a few years, I was just racked by guilt. Uh, I didn't know who I could talk to about it. I didn't talk to anyone because I was just too, too ashamed of my sin. But in God's kindness, that led me to search scripture. Uh, I'd grown up kind of hearing about the Bible and being taught to listen to preachers, but I didn't really ever just sit down and read the Bible for myself and hear what it had to say. I was always listening to what other people said about it. And so at about 17 years old, as I searched God's word, I heard that God demonstrates his love for us in this that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. But this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. One verse that really stuck with me was, the grace of God teaches us to say no to sin. It's not my sense of duty that teaches me to say no to sin. It's not my good works that will beat my sin, but it's God's grace. And these verses really changed my life. I saw that, yes, Jesus' death saves me, but his gracious forgiveness isn't something I just need once. It's something I always need. And his grace is the way that I'm going to stay in his family. We're kept safe by grace through faith alone in Jesus. And that's my story. Thank you, Nat, for sharing. Why don't I pray for Nat uh, and give thanks to God. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for your goodness to us. And uh, Lord, we know that we don't deserve it. Um, it only comes from your uh, generous heart, your, your compassionate hand. Uh, Father, thank you that uh, you save us by grace and keep us by grace. 
And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you made that clear to Nat uh, through his lifetime, uh, through the ups and downs, through the struggles. Thank you, Lord, for humbling him uh, after a childhood that seemed um, uh, almost perfect. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you have helped him to know that your uh, fatherly love is not something that we earn like slaves, but something that we receive as your children. And we uh, pray this uh, for our joy and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, now we are going to have the kids spot. So there are a few kids. Come on down. And Kylie is going to lead us today. Come on awesome. Down. Number we, one. We need oh, more kids. We need That's more kids. Brilliant. Fantastic. Can we get a few couple more. Any awesome. more? Fantastic. Wonderful. I can Wonderful. see a couple more coming. Great. Okay. Can you guys see and hear me and see and hear the screen? Yeah. Awesome. I've got a couple of you today. That's cool. Um, put your hand up if you know the answer to anything I ask you, okay? So today I'm going to talk to you about a really interesting topic. Are my slides good to go? Yep. Idolatry. And there's a question mark after it because I know for a fact that my friend Adrian's about to talk to your parents about this, so I think you guys are big enough to hear about it too, hey? The question mark is, I don't know if you know anything about idolatry. So put your hands up. Do any of you guys know what idolatry is? That's okay. We can start with that. No one in the church. Oh, I was looking down here. I should look here. Well, well Adrian, you've, you've got your work cut out for you. There you go. Okay, so idolatry is putting anything at all ahead of God. Worshipping something other than God. Spending more time or effort on something other than God. And I've got a few inspirations up here. We don't have many girls in the audience today, that's okay. You all probably have met a girl, whether she's your sister or your cousin or whatever. Do you remember some little girls, probably around preschool age now? Anyone remember girls were obsessed with this Emma? You know, to all the music, dressed like I carried around as a little toy hug driver everywhere we went. I think Emma might be an idol, what do you guys think? Yeah? Not for you, but I think some people. What about this one for the boys? You ever gone to Saturday morning sport and it's been pushed on to Sunday morning and you begged mum to take you to sport or dad to take you to sport instead of church? Hands up, who likes sport? Yeah. Potential to be an idol. What about this one? Your mum packs your really healthy lunchbox to school and you see what's in your friend's lunchbox and you're willing to do anything for it. Like give up your whole healthy lunch if you could just have one thing out of their lunchbox. Sometimes can treats be an idol? Maybe. What about this one? You ever had those hot wheel cars and you're so into your cars that you want to build a thing that goes the whole way around your room? You boys do this? Play with your cars? No cars? Oh, okay. You what? I have a lot of things I hardly play with. Well, that's good. They can't be an idol if you hardly play with them. That's brilliant. I'll skip that one. What about the girls? Do you know any girls that are obsessed with Barbie? This is the Barbie from the Barbie movie. So they didn't just have to have all the dolls and dress all the dolls and have the perfect dream house. Now they have to go to the cinemas and watch all about it for another hour and a half. Any of you boys got dragged along by a girl, a sister, a friend? No. Is it all the girls we're talking about at school? Really annoying you? Okay, well, maybe, maybe I was wrong about that one. What about this one? Yeah, ever yourself or anyone you know? Oh, can I have that ice cream? Can I have that ice cream? Can I have that ice cream until, yep, we're getting some hands over here. This is good. Have you ever screamed out for ice cream? Honestly? Okay. I actually know quite a lot of ice cream shops that are now called Ice Cream for Ice Cream. They must get it from somewhere. So these were just some ideas I had. Any of you guys down here had any ideas yourself of what might be an idol? Yep. That's a good one, very good one. How much time do people spend on social media versus how much time do they spend reading the Bible? That's a very good one, too much, I like it. Anyone else, any ideas? What you think an idol might be? Oh, I like that one over there, excellent. Yep. Yeah, look, I had some of those pictures and I did put them on the screen. I had, oh, I didn't Minecraft, I had roadblocks and I had Taylor Swift and I thought, oh, maybe you guys were a little bit too young for that, but I love that you know that. Every girl has to have something to do with Taylor Swift and most of the boys are going to keep the girlfriends or the sisters or the whatever's happy. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. 
Is listening to music, whether it be Emma the Wiggle or Taylor Smith, necessarily bad? No? God doesn't have a problem if we listen to music. In fact, he likes it when we get excited and listening to music and singing with passion, particularly if we're singing with passion to him. What about sports? Does God like it when we do sports? Yeah? Play hard for your team? Look after your fellow teammates? What about food? Does God like it when we eat and put the food in our bodies we need to keep going and living for him, yeah? Nothing wrong with food. Playing with cars, even if we only spend a little bit of time doing it. God likes it when we play with our toys and share them with our friends, right? Yeah? Well, there you go, the toys, we'll skip that one. What about ice cream? Does God like it if we have a treat occasionally? Nothing wrong with that. Eat ice cream every day, you'll be quite sick, but an ice cream here and there not gonna hurt you. So if none of these things are bad, why are they idols? Yep. Very good. God has given us all these good things on this earth to enjoy. But if we make them an idol by putting them before God, that's the only reason they become bad. Great answer. I'm going to leave you guys with that, and I think we're off to Kids Church. Let's go, guys. And uh, this week, thanks for the more college students. That's terrific. Uh, They will take a break most likely over the next couple of weeks with the holidays. But now's a chance just to say good day. Look, there's lots of uh, visitors here today, so mostly more college students, I think. But um, here's a minute just to turn around, say good day, introduce yourself, ask them how they're going. Highlight of the week, something like that. Well, we're going to hear from Adrian in a moment, um, but I thought we'd just get to know him very briefly. So have you had a good week, Adrian? I have, thanks, Yeah, Yeah, that's terrific. Um, where are you normally on a Sunday morning? On a Sunday morning, I serve as a student minister at St. Andrew's Cathedral. That's a, that's a good church to go to. Isn't it is, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Good church, yeah. And uh, what about on a Saturday morning? What, what do you like to do on uh, a day off? Saturday's a slow day, so I... I I may be still sleeping in the morning, and then I like brunch. Sometimes I go for a jog. Great. Yeah. yeah so it doesn't sound like you're pushing yourself too hard. <laughs> no, there's a Dean's Run, which happens oh. once a month. It's beautiful around Circular Quay yeah, and uh, yeah. to join in with people. To, but, but to, usually to keep, to keep in the boss's good books, you, 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 you roll out a bit. Excellent, I excellent. You there, good, no, I know, I know. It's in my diary. I've never made it. Um, Terrific. Okay, well, thanks, Adrian. Uh, We're going to hear from him very soon, but uh, Russell's now going to bring us the Bible reading from Acts chapter 17, page 984 of the Church Bibles. Will you give me something to lay? Good morning. Uh, Just before I start, um, I want to say a word about um, something that appears in this uh, reading about the place called the Areopagus 
Most of you possibly know about it, but just in case you don't, um, it's worth explaining. The Areopagus was a, a low hill just to the south of the Acropolis in Athens. Um, on the top of that hill is a big flat rock, at least there is now, I don't know where there was then. Uh, and in Paul's day, it was a very important gathering place with people who had something to say to the crowds gathered there. They had uh, legal discussions, political talks and so on. And that's why Paul winds up on the Areopagus. So let's get down to business. So uh, Acts chapter 17, verse, starting in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who debated with him, some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every re from one man he has made every nationality from one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. But others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Russ. Good morning, friends. What a privilege it's been to spend time with you this week. And we thank God for your warm hospitality, your generous hearts, and sharing your life with us. We're really thankful for your gospel partnership. As we're about to look into this passage, would you please join me as we pray? Excuse me. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you that your word is written for our understanding and it gives light and life. Please help me speak clearly and faithfully so that we may grow in our love and understanding of you in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you heard the saying, ignorance is bliss? Yet, is ignorance bliss? Perhaps that's why some say, what you don't know can't hurt you. Or, out of sight, out of mind. Yet, is it true? 
The question's not straightforward, and there are times when it's required to not know. It might be the loving or required thing to do. It's loving for parents to withhold information from a child who may not be age appropriate, or it's required for businesses and committees to keep sensitive information sensitive. Yet, is ignorance bliss? Is not knowing or being in the dark desirable? Say you're driving a car and you have a blind spot. You'd want to know a car's there. You'd want 20-20 vision. Whether it's board games or in the boardroom, knowledge is important. And there's some information that's just too important to ignore. There's some information that's too important to remain in the dark about, too important to get wrong worshiping God and how we relate to him. Knowledge and understanding of God matters. God's too important to get wrong. And here we see the people in Athens were off track. They're off the dark, in the dark. Paul's on his second missionary journey. We see him move around the coast and he's now in Athens. The year is AD 50. He'd wanted to visit churches to ensure that they were doing well yet it was not smooth sailing. We're down in that coast there at the moment. Well, anyways, Athens was known for a city, for its philosophers, its intellect. It was seen as a melting pot of ideas and its many gods. Yet as Paul visits the city, we're told that the people there were very religious, yet they had a problem. They did not know God. There was even a statue to an unknown God. Paul sees a city full of idols and he yearns that they know the one and true God. So if you'd like to take notes, we move through three stages today. Firstly, we visit the setting in verses 16 to 21. Then we move and hear the speech in verses 22 to 31. And finally, we see the response. As we join Paul in Athens, let's see the setting to which Paul is in. So Paul finds himself deeply distressed. He feels it in his pit, he's moved in his spirit. Why? As he waits for his friends, he sees that the city is full of idols. We've talked about it in the kids' spot. An idol is something that takes God's place. It takes his glory. It's a false god. There were many statues here. We walk up and down the street. We see gods and goddesses to Zeus and Apollos, Hermes and Nike. Maybe they're more known as fashion brands to us. Yet similarly from Athens to Asquith, what might we see? We, not, we walk not far up and down this street and we see all these places of worship. We take the train up and down and we might see people serving created things rather than the creation, creator. Or we go the other way and we see people worshiping creation and not acknowledging the hands who made it. Don't get me wrong, these are good things. These are good gifts. Yet if they're taken to the extreme, they twist and turn our hearts and desires, and they become gods with the small g. Yet what Paul sees is a city full of idols. Yet the symptoms were actually deeper than that. Not only in Athens or Asquith, we look into our hearts, and we might see that too. John Calvin, a theologian, said, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. Our hearts are idol factories. The source of the issue stems from within. We serve ourselves, we serve created things rather than our creator. So seeing all this, what's Paul's next move? Well, he takes opportunity to speak to whoever he can, whoever would listen, and we see three groups. Looking from verse 17, we see, first he goes to the synagogue, with the Jews and the Greek fearers. Next is in the bustling marketplaces who, to whoever will pass by and listen, perhaps like outside Woolies or Kmart. Yeah, hear about Anglicare and God's love shown, but also meet Jesus and find meaning and satisfaction in life. Next, he speaks to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, two groups that were very different worldviews. Yet Paul speaks to whoever he can and whoever would stop by and listen, everyone and anyone. But what did they think of him? Read on in verse 18. Some of the philosophers also debated with him. And some said, 
What is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities. They called him ignorant, a show-off, a babbler. He talks about gods who are not their own. And what was this message about? It was about the good news about Jesus and his resurrection. Some of these guys said, yeah, a bodily resurrection? That just doesn't make sense. It was a foreign idea to the Greeks. Certainly, after you die, your body doesn't rise again. Once you're dead, you're dead. That was not good news. But who was really in the dark? They liked new ideas, so it did interest them. And they wanted to hear, hear him more. As Ross explained, we, they take him and they whisk him along to the Areopagus, where decisions were made. Gods were approved, in fact, by the council members. Yet, that's a god. We'll, we'll put a statue up to him. The important and the influential met and decided who they thought would be a god. So we see the setting. Paul sees a city full of idols, people who did not know the one true God. And he, to an unknown God, he, to an unknown God, he'd been to the synagogues, to the markets, and walked the streets. I remember walking outside Adelaide Oval one time. Anyone been there? Yet yeah, they have statue after statue, don't they, of sporting heroes. Oh, let me just get the rights. Sorry. St Anyone recognize this guy? The Don, the Don, yeah. Here in Athens, looking left and right, we see statue and statue, and even one to an unknown God. They were so caught up in gods that they even caught one. Oh, we'll, 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 superstitious, we'll, we'll, we'll put one here anyway, just in case um, we can please God. We'll have a statue to him. Imagine having an unknown player outside at the late Oval. We love sports, but wouldn't that be a bit ridiculous? And statue to an unknown player. And here, Paul highlights the problem, and he also highlights a solution. And how does he go about this? He proclaims to them the message of Jesus, the one true God worthy of worship. And what can they know in light of Jesus and his resurrection? Well, there's going to be two main points. First, God reveals himself generally in creation. He does this as the creator, the ruler, and sustainer. Let's take a look. As we marvel at his creation, we marvel at the creator. He's not created or contained. Creation comes from him, all creatures great and small. All the waterways we've enjoyed this week, the national parks, everything by his hand, he is the source. He is the sustainer. He gives life and breath to all. From a small baby to an elderly infant, he is the source of strength. He keeps you and I going by the breath he gives. He sustains all. He sustains you, he sustains me, and he sustains his church. And he is the ruler. Sure, they're Caesars and they're kings, Yet he is the king of kings. He is the one who appoints the boundaries and the times where people live. He is on his throne. God's the ultimate ruler. He is sovereign. Whether it's Asquith or Newtown, Iran or China, God appoints our times. God knows where we live and move and have our being. So that's our first point. God, the creator, ruler and sustainer. Yet he's not only out there. Our next point Paul brings us to is that God makes himself known in here. He is personal and relational. The gears change and we move from outside to inside. However, the Athenians seem to have a problem. It was like this morning after a shower, it's a bit misty in the mirror. They had a vague outline, but they couldn't see clearly. They had a vague idea of truth, but they needed to know what was clearly true. They tried on their own to understand God. They had idols left, right, and center, but it was slim pickings that they could understand God on their own. They were ignorant. They were in the dark. 
So Paul speaks to them from a poet that they understand, a guy from Crete. And he talks about this really important word. We see it in verse 28. Offspring or descendant. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. People were designed for relationship to God. Have you heard that term, like father, like son? Or like, oh, she sounds like her sister on the phone or, or whatever it is. Well, the Athenians were made in God's image. They were to reflect that as his children. Yet it's not only a distant concept of God being out there, it was personal. It wasn't restricted to statues or idols and temples. It's deeply personal. If you were at the woman's talk this week, Rachel talked about and celebrated the fact that we are made in God's image. Ultimately, we have gifts of creation, but we're made in God's image. And the divine image is so much more than what we worship or what we can fashion with our hands. In verse 29, we see then, since then, we are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold, silver, stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination, as God's offspring was so much more precious to him. Yet, yet, that image is distorted. We know the first Adam, and we know what he did. Ignorance and disobedience broke that relationship to God, scarred it, caused the mirror to go blurry. And we, like him, like Adam, have taken on that stain, that scar, that disobedience, that ignorance, that hardness of heart. And our hearts are idol factories. We share in his nature. If you remember at the men's breakfast, Tim talked about my rule, my life, my career, my soccer, my psych, whatever that is, that crown that we put on our own heads, coming from distorted vision of God, coming from sin. How can we know God more clearly? Well, the answer is found in looking to Jesus. God sent Jesus to bring in a new period of history. We see that God sends Jesus and he'll send him back again to judge. The ignorance, the mist in the mirror, that can be swiped right away, swiped clean by knowing God through Jesus. We know God because he's appointed a judge and a redeemer. Reading from verse 30, we see that therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus has come as savior and redeemer. He'll come one day as judge. In our world, in our society, we value equality, freedom, autonomy. Yet we also need to remember that we give account to God as our judge. God commands everyone everywhere to repent. Sure, that's a word that's thrown around, but what does that mean? It means making a U-turn, a change of mind, a change of heart. The idols that we rule, that rule over us have no place if we live under God's rule. We'd be ignorant to think that we can live life on our own that we could live life without God, without his sustenance, that we can know God from far away in creation, yet keep him at arm's length. We worship false gods when we ignore what Jesus has done. So whether it's Athens or Asquith, what idols do we worship? Don't get me wrong, some of these are good gifts that we can receive with thanksgiving. 
I'm thankful for a sleep in. I'm thankful for sport. I'm thankful for coffee. Yet, people worship so many created things, whether it's in the shopping mall, gizmos, gadgets, styles, or whether it's an experience in comfort, hobbies, and holidays, or whether they're enslaved to their career, climbing that ladder for more money, for what other isms or workaholism, or enslaved by alcohol and alcoholism and substances and times on screens, pornography, people worshiping the environment, or they worship themselves and their physical bodies as the only and ultimate temple. Friends, Paul wants people to know freedom and salvation in Jesus' name, a rescue from sin, a rescue from idolatry, done by trusting in the death of his son. And he's confirmed that by rising him again from the dead. People want, Paul wants people to know life, and true life found in Jesus Christ. We need not be ignorant or misty about God. We can know him through Jesus, his son. This was scandalous, not only because the Greeks didn't believe in resurrection, it was scandalous that God would send his son sinless to die for people who are so sinful, to make us righteous, make us just, make us perfect in his sight. Yet, how might we respond? To what Jesus has done. Jesus as judge and saviour. His offer of forgiveness. A blank slate, wiped clean. Elsewhere in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, therefore if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is born. The poet got it right. For in him we live and move and have our being. It's in Christ who we trust. The old is gone, the new has come. In Christ we live and move and have our being today. So how might you respond to God? Well, in our next section, we see three different responses. Some reject and ridicule. Some accept. And some want to hear more. So how do we respond? Many Greeks just could not accept the fact of the bodily resurrection. Accepting Jesus was just ridiculous. We see that some began to ridicule him. Faith, we hear our friends say, or work colleagues say, is blind, it's silly, it's invisible. An invisible savior, well, that's not for me. It's impossible to believe. It, I'm not a person of faith. I'm too skeptical, I'm too scared to take that next leap. It's ridiculous. Or they might say, look, I, I'm, I'm a scientist and I assume we live by evidence and science and reason and laboratory findings and certain conditions. Yet is faith and science incompatible? I urge the person who thinks it's ridiculous to think again. Let me bring your attention to an article in the ABC by Michael Jensen. He wrote a few weeks ago during Easter that resurrections have consequences. Why conspiracy theories about Christianity are irresistible. He asks, is the, is the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth one of the greatest hoaxes ever played on humankind? Is it a gigantic fraud perpetrated by the church to prop up its institutional power? Look it up and read on to see what he says. But others said, we'd like to hear you again about this. And maybe you've been to the Meet Jesus event or wish that you could invite a friend along. Maybe you've heard the Mark drama. If not, why not see the gospel story acted out tonight? Come along. Or perhaps you want to hear more. And what's the best gift God could give you? Invite a friend. Come along to the Life Explored course starting up soon. Or invite a friend to read Mark's gospel with you. Why not? Some want to hear more. And finally, we see the third group. Some joined Paul and joined Jesus and believed. They accepted his good news and they responded in repentance 
and faith. Yet Paul's mission doesn't stop there. Today, we are recipients of this gospel as it's gone from Athens to Asquith, as it continues to go to other parts of the world, to Lightning Ridge and to Japan. Will you join in this mission of Christ to make him known, to proclaim his worth and glory, to worship him? Or have you kept him at a distance? Or have you accepted him as your heavenly father, you his child, his offspring through faith. And what if today you've recognized that I've been coming to church all this, all this time ticking off the boxes, but in fact, I've just been ignorant. I've been living for myself and my idols. It's time to stop, to turn around and to look to Jesus. If that is you, I invite you to know God as your Father and Jesus as Lord, to accept the salvation he freely gives. We express this in dependence and faith and trust in God, and we say this and we talk to our Heavenly Father in prayer. We say sorry and ask for forgiveness. You might wish to say these words in the quietness of your hearts, and the words will be on the screen. Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I'm guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me, paying my debt and bearing my punishment that I may be forgiven. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen. Friends, if you've joined me in praying, know the assurance of sins forgiven. Know new life in Christ. And as you continue on in this journey with Jesus as Lord and Saviour, please allow the church family to support and encourage you along this way and make yourself known to the leaders of the church. God is so much bigger than the idols in our heart, the things that we see and touch and move and serve. Paul proclaims Jesus, the one true God, worthy of worship, who we turn to in repentance and faith. And we see that he's proved this by rising him again from the dead. And in him we live and move and have our being. So how could we be ignorant? When it comes to God, it matters who we worship. There's some important things that just can't be left unchecked. And Paul wants people of all backgrounds, all cultures and philosophies, all intellects, male or female, young or old, to turn from their idols and to turn to his son and to know him as the creator, ruler, sustainer, redeemer, and judge. This week, I thank God for your partnership, your warm hospitality on behalf of our team, as together we've sought to proclaim Christ and to make him known. We can rest in knowing that God is sovereign and it's his mission that we're part of. We thank him for his word and in the power of his spirit, what he's taught us as a team and what he's continuing to do through you here. May the Lord keep you and bless you. Amen. Let's all stand for the next song, Jerusalem. Thank you. 
uh, beginning with a prayer of confession. And every prayer of confession really has a few simple parts. Uh, we say sorry, uh, we say thank you, and we say please. Um, this uh, prayer of confession is inspired by Acts 17, so please would you pray along with me. Almighty God, we thank you for creating us and for making us to know you and enjoy you. Thank you that you are not a distant, hidden God. We're sorry for the idols we construct in our hearts and minds. How foolish we are to ever wish to contain or control you. Please forgive us when we set our hopes on false gods, giving to them the affection and allegiance that should be yours alone. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you that he reveals your true nature and character. Thank you that his death has paid for our sin. Thank you that his resurrection offers us new life. Thank you that he's coming again to vanquish evil and save all who trust in him. Please help us now to trust in Jesus. As your people, may we live for you and love our neighbours. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Rachel's now going to continue leading us in prayer. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we give you great praise for who you are. Thank you for being the God who makes himself knowable. Thank you that we can know you, that we can know you in creation, in the water, the animals, the landscapes, the stars, the sky. Thank you that we can know who you are as a creator and that you are God and sovereign over all. But thank you most of all that you make yourself known to us in our hearts, that you are personal and relational, that you love us and know us and allow us to know you. Father, I pray for those uh, among our community who are still working out who you are to them. Please give them wisdom and insight. Help them to ask good questions and surround them with people to ask them to. I pray that as they spend time in your word, they would discover that you are trustworthy, that you are who you are, and please give them confidence to follow you. Father, I pray for those of us who do follow you, but have seen today that we have an idol problem, that we are so tempted so often to make good gifts from you in your place, to worship them as God. Father, please instead captivate us by Jesus and the life that is in him. Help us to repent and to turn around back to you, to follow you as God alone. We thank you, Father, for the week that's been, for our, all our April outreach activities. Thank you uh, for the chances to share the gospel and to engage with the story of Jesus in lots of different ways. And we thank you so much for the hospitality and partnership of St. John's Asquith with the college team. Thank you so much for those who have provided meals for us, for those who have hosted us, for those who have engaged us in conversation, who have got to know us, and who have extended the arm of friendship to us. We thank you that though we, most of us didn't know each other at the start of the week, we are united in Christ. And I pray that that unity would be an encouragement to all of us as we go on from this week. We pray for the people who've been part of our outreach activities, for those who might've heard the gospel for the first time. We pray that you would allow that gospel seed to be planted in their hearts. Father, please help them to be convicted of the truth of the gospel, to turn and face you, to put their trust in you. And we pray that the message about Jesus will keep going out from here at Asquith. We pray that many people in our suburbs would come to know Jesus through us. As we are captivated by the story of Jesus, please let it be on our lips as we speak to others, that we will be eager to share with them the life and love that are ours in Jesus. And we pray that this message would go out in a world full of violence and despair. 
where people fear for their safety, they worry for their loved ones, they see injustice, and they fear that justice will never be done. We know that, Father, you are the ultimate just God, that you will bring justice and peace one day. But we pray that you would bring it now as well. Please bring peace where there is violence. Please bring justice where there is none. And help us as your people to be peacemakers. Please change the hearts of those who do wrong to others. Help them to be convicted of their sin and to turn to you to find forgiveness and to make their wrongs right. We, Father, that we pray, Father, that you would ultimately bring justice through Jesus' return, and we know that you will. So we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. I'm just checking if we have our standard prayers as well. No, oh no, no worries. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, I've got a couple of announcements. Uh, so, who was at the uh, Mark Drama last night? Hands up, hands up. Okay. Now, in the true spirit of Mark Drama, just call out, maybe even all at once, uh, one or two words to describe what it was. We'll start with this, you know, one or two words to describe how it was. Powerful. Powerful. Moving. Moving. One more. Amazing. Amazing. Over here. Poignant. Oh, F- funny, funny. Awesome. awesome. Yes. So if you didn't make it last night, don't miss out. It was really good. Um, my daughter uh, said to me, teenage daughter, mind you, take note, teenage daughter said, Dad, that was, that was pretty good. <laughs> and she's going to come back a second time tonight. So there you go. That's a 10 out of 10, maybe 11 out of 10 rating. Um, So um, yeah, if you missed it tonight, and it's not too late to invite your non-Christian family, friends and neighbours. After all, there's not a whole lot else happening on a Sunday night in Asquith. So um, come on down, come on down. Um, Apologies to the church across across the road. Um, uh, Life Explored is um, something that many of us have uh, been a part of uh, recently, this term, and we're going to watch a clip just to whet your appetite again. Fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to the course. Uh, I hope uh, you can invite people along or come along yourself. I, I find that the course is actually more interesting when there's a mix of Christian people and those who are exploring. Uh, it's a really, it's a really great course, and actually ties in very nicely with our message today, which is all about uh, idolatry. Um, a lot of the Life Explore course is thinking about what are the idols in our lives and how much better it is to know the true and living God. So come along. Now, here's uh, a chance to let us know um, both whether you'd like to come along to the Life Explore course um, and just your feedback in general because 
Uh, we've been doing a few new things the last couple of weeks, and today the new thing is filling in this QR code. I'd love everyone to have a go. Let's see if we can bring down the internet um, as we fill it in. So grab your phone. Look at that. That's a good look at that example. Fantastic. Grab your phone. Take a photo either up on the screen or there's little ones in the in the pews there. And uh, let us know what you think. Let us know what you think. Um, I think it's as simple as in fact, I'm going to do it too. Okay, so it's as simple as putting in your first name. You've got to put in your first name. If, by the way, your phone's not working today, there's paper and pen as well. Rachel can hand them out. Um, but it's as simple as putting in your first name. That's all we need to know. And then there's a few ticker box options, such as join a Life Explored course, which we just saw about, reading Mark's Gospel. Fantastic thing to do. It's a script of the Mark drama. So if you've seen the Mark drama or if you will miss it, then you want to read the script. Find out more about St John's. If you're already at another church, that's terrific. Um, and then comments or questions. So, for example, um, you could uh, tell us what you thought of Adrian's uh, fashion sense. Uh, you could write me a joke. You could do a haiku on Acts 17. That would be very edifying. Um, or you could perhaps indicate that that was the first time you'd prayed a prayer like that. And we would love, as Adrian said, we'd love to follow you up and encourage you in that. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to fill that in. Go for it. Good one. So we're all learning how to do that. I don't think we brought down the internet, which is nice. Um, another five seconds. Well, our closing song today is called Rock of Ages. It's a wonderful old song. Uh, the opening lyric says, Rock of Ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, which is a little bit intriguing. It's picking up on a story from the Old Testament where God forms a cleft in a rock for Moses so that Moses, who's a sinner just like you and me, so that he's not destroyed as God passes by, as God's glory uh, passes by him. And the song goes on to illustrate how Jesus himself is the rock who was cleft for you and for me in his death on the cross. So please... Uh, sing along and let's stand for Rock of Ages.
and live in God and to have hope in the end when Jesus returns. Uh, friends, uh, stick around for morning tea. It'd be lovely, uh, as we've already heard, some highlights of this week and a testimony of God's grace. Please share that uh, over a cuppa. God bless. Thank you.